Why do we need the latest and greatest in computer hardware? No, seriously, why do we need it? That was the question I originally asked when I started to make this video. Surely, if you really want to play games in 2025, you don't need a multi-thousand dollar graphics card shoved in a system that costs about the same as a used car, right? The NVIDIA GeForce 8800 GTS 512 is far from new, far from supported, and an absolute mouthful to sneak into casual conversation. Funnily enough, I snagged up an EVGA model on eBay about a year ago to throw into an SLI build, only to realize it's not SLI compatible with the regular GeForce 8800 GTS, leaving me with a random old card without a build to throw it in. That is, until recently, when I upgraded my main gaming rig and put my old parts in a new case to turn them into a game server. Not only was this the perfect time to throw this card into a system, but it also gave me the perfect environment to see the card's full potential, pairing it with a high-end, modern CPU and more than enough RAM. Now that I had a perfect system to test with, I could really see what the 8800 GTS 512 was made of. Well, first I actually had to get the graphics drivers to install, which is a process on its own. To put it simply, First, I had to throw a surrogate GPU in the system, my choice being a spare GT710. Then I had to quickly install the graphics drivers and pray the system accepts it. Then I quickly shut down the system and yank out the second GPU before it catches on fire from being in the second slot, fighting with the motherboard connections, stopping the fan, and pray the drivers will cooperate. Okay, now that I have working drivers and it'll run at 1080p, how do actual games run? The first game I tested was Minecraft, and honestly, I didn't expect it to run. And if it did, I didn't expect it to run well. As it turns out, you really don't need much to run the latest Minecraft update at 1080p, pushing 86 FPS on fast graphics and 83 FPS on fancy. It took running the game on fabulous graphics for it to drop below 60 FPS, still hitting a playable 43 frames per second average. Portal 2 also gave this card an impressive showing, being able to run at 1080p mostly high settings at 72 FPS and an intensive canned graphics benchmark. Quick editor's note, the Portal 2 benchmark I featured in the video is not something that comes with the base game, I had to find it on the workshop. Just for fun, I also did a short playthrough of the first section of chapter seven to give myself a better expectation of real world performance and it crushed it. The card hit over 100 FPS and only dipped below 60 with the larger set pieces. What better game to test next than one that takes place in current year? COD Black Ops 2, running at 1080p low settings, which is what the game automatically applied on launch, reached an average of 57 FPS. Not quite a 60 FPS experience, but with the rain effects and extremely large environment, I think that's more than impressive for a card that was already nearing a half decade. Battlefield 4 is just about as close to a modern shooter as this card can run, listing the 8800 GTS 512's little brother 8800 GT as the minimum graphics requirement. And the opening cutscene does look extremely good, even running on the lowest possible settings. The advanced graphics come at a price though, with the card struggling to keep the game playable and only pushing 36 FPS on average. And to make things worse, the turned out graphics settings really become apparent when a player model pops up and we see more than the opening hallway. Maybe we finally reached the breaking point for this card. Lastly, I ran the card through 3 Mark's DirectX 10 Vantage Benchmark. As fun as it would be to see the 8800 push 2 FPS on something like Time Spy, it just isn't DirectX 12 compatible, so this is the most we can do. The card ran at less than cinematic frame rates for most of the benchmark, sometimes even dipping below double digit FPS. Maybe this benchmark is a tad bit too much for this card. Even 3D Mark giving it graphics score of 6072 puts it below their expected results for a gaming laptop of the time. Okay, maybe we need a bit more than the 8800, unless you're playing nothing but Minecraft or one of five DirectX 10 titles you can still get on PC. I'm still impressed by the card though. It managed to play popular games from long after its time at resolutions it wasn't meant to push, all while being incredibly loud due to the blower style cooler, which is my personal favorite. It kind of reminds me of the GTX 1080 Ti, able to push resolutions it really shouldn't be hitting years after it was relevant. Just my kind of card. Now, I bought that 8800 512 for about $50 on eBay. Not a bad price for such an old card. You know what else I was able to find for about the same price? None other than a GTX 970. I saw it listed around the same time as I got the 8800, being sold as untested and likely a scrap card for parts. I took a chance on it, even if it might end up as a paperweight. 
and by the luck of EVGA, it worked first try without any instability or issues. Naturally, now that I had two cards I spent roughly the same amount on, cost about the same when they launched, and were basically the same class card for their respective generation, I wondered what the performance difference might be between them. So I went ahead and threw it in the same system and ran it through the benchmarks again. Along with a few more titles, the 8800 couldn't even dream of running. Starting with Minecraft again, the 970 didn't hesitate to show just how much more power it produces, hitting the same FPS on fast and fancy graphics of over 650 frames and turning the CPU into the bottleneck. It only relented a bit when I threw it on fabulous settings, but it still reached over 380 FPS average. Honestly, if I wasn't keeping the games locked to 1080p for parity, I could probably run the game at 4K and still have plenty of frames left over for a fancy texture pack or shaders. Portal 2 had an even more impressive uplift, reaching 220 FPS average on the canned benchmark at maximum setting. Once again, I could probably run this game at 4K and have enough frames to throw in mods. It ran even better putting it through a real gameplay scenario, hitting almost 340 FPS average being chased by Wheatley. Black Ops 2 continued the trend, hitting an average of 301 FPS. Something to note with Black Ops 2 is the game automatically bumped up the settings to medium instead of low, although I'm sure you won't notice that over just how much better it runs. I probably could have run this at 4K too. At this rate, who needs an RTX 5090? Battlefield 4 also bumped up the settings to medium, and once again it really didn't affect performance and it absolutely slammed into the FPS cap. Okay, either I need to bump up the resolution, the graphics settings, or I need to run some significantly tougher games. 3D Mark Vantage ran so well it actually made the benchmark fun to watch compared to the 8800, remaining over triple digits for almost the entire run. The system ran so well that not only did the 970 breach the 50k points barrier, but the final combined score was higher than that expected of a 4k ready gaming PC from the time. This is an older benchmark though, and it was already 6 years old by the time the 970 launched. Maybe something newer might start up the pod. Now that we have access to DirectX 12, we can really push this card to its limit. Star Wars Jedi Survivor is one of the most graphics intensive games I own, making it perfect for absolutely terrorizing older cards. To be honest, I didn't expect much coming from a GPU almost a decade older than the game I was testing it with, and it's probably a good thing I tempered my expectations as it was barely able to handle 1080p low settings. On average, it hit 32 FPS, just above cinematic frame rates. Our next stop is Counter-Strike 2 and this time the card ran quite a lot better than I expected. Using the recommended settings at 1080p, the canned benchmark, which I had to find in the workshop since CS2 doesn't seem to have a built-in vanilla benchmark, reached an average of 106 FPS, more than playable even on a higher refresh rate monitor. It's right in the sweet spot where you can mess with the settings to either get higher fidelity or higher frame rates, depending on your preferences. F124 is our final gaming stop on the GTX 970 ride, being the latest title in my lineup and requiring DirectX 12. Running 1080p medium, the card reached an average of 75 FPS doing a single rainy lap around Monte Carlo. If you're looking to play a modern racing game, it'll be more than capable for driving it to turn one at full throttle on your favorite track. Ending with something a bit more scientific, I put the 970 through Time Spy to see if it can last the test of time, and with it being 2 years older than the benchmark, we'll get a really good idea of that. While Time Spy definitely isn't the most forgiving benchmark, I was disappointed seeing a score of just 1681. Not the most impressive result, but it'll be a good baseline going forward. Compared to the 8800, the GTX 970 blows it out of the water. The fact I got both at the same price is actually kind of astonishing, although not many people are really looking for a nearly two decade old GPU just to play a handful of DirectX 10 and older titles. Now that I have these two tested, I guess I'll have to find another GPU to throw into the ring, although it may take some time for another 70 class card to become affordable. Until then, I'll just put the side panel back on and... What the f- Okay, 70 class graphics cards may still cost about as much as a month's worth of full-time work at minimum wage, but the budget sector is still here and barely breathing. And from what I've read, the GTX 1650 is only marginally worse than the GTX 970. It's quite a bargain going off the original MSRP, being almost $200 cheaper at launch. Skipping Minecraft for this one, since the 970 already reached a CPU bottleneck, I jumped right into Portal 2 and managed 213 FPS on the canned benchmark. Only about 7% worse than the 970 running the same test. According to Tech Power Up, the 1650 is supposed to be roughly 17-23% to 23 slower than the 970, so we're managing to beat those numbers for now. Maybe the newer titles are where the 1650 really struggles. 
Jedi Survivor managed to show the real strength of the 1650 over the 970, DirectX 12. While the game still struggled, the 1650 pulled a big lead as it reached a 38 FPS average at 1080p low. I know a whole 6 FPS increase doesn't seem like much and you might not feel the difference if you're playing on a controller, but that's a 19% increase over the 970. Counter-Strike 2 continues the trend of newer titles favoring the newer card, leaving the GTX 970 in the dust as we hit 120 FPS average in the benchmark on recommended settings 1080p, despite being a DirectX 11 title. This is also where you can ignore the big red text in the benchmark footage, as I'm just reusing the same footage from the 970 since I really don't want to record the same benchmark multiple times when you really can't tell the difference after this video is rendered and uploaded. F124 once again continues the trend as a wet lap at Monte Carlo sees us reaching over 90 FPS at 1080p medium. That gives us plenty of room to bump up to a couple of higher settings if we really wanted to, making your view of the tire barrier even better. Lastly, I gave the GTX 1650 a run at Time Spy for another highly controlled graphics score. This time we got a score of 1750, a surprising 4% increase in performance over the 970. It's clear the GTX 1650 can throw above its weight class, handedly beating the GTX 970 in newer titles and only fumbling in Portal 2, a DirectX 9 title, on an extreme graphics test. With the 1650 providing so much performance at such a good price, it really has me hopeful for what cards in, let's say another 5 years, are capable of producing. Surely Nvidia will keep up having a steady and noticeable performance climb while keeping prices steady. You know. I'm really not a big fan of the RTX 3050, especially the 6GB variant. It's the current entry level budget card Nvidia has out right now and it brings shame to the 50 class family. Or at least that's what all the tech reviewers on YouTube have me thinking. With a $179 MSRP, it's about 20% more expensive than the GTX 1650 was at launch, although it's becoming increasingly more difficult to find cards at that price. With most on Amazon reaching $200 or more for the lowly 6GB variant, if you can even find them. I managed to get my hands on one, originally for another project, for less than $140 thanks to a sneaky open box deal not too long ago. Maybe the card's better than all the tech tubers say it is. Maybe it really is worth that 20% cost increase MSRP over the GTX 1650. Initially, my hopes were high as I ran the Portal 2 benchmark, hitting nearly 300 FPS average. That's a pretty big bump in performance over the 1650, more than enough to justify running the game at 4K maxed out. With such a strong start, Maybe the rest of the titles on my list will show the same promise. I expected Jedi Survivor to hit 60 FPS with the RTX 3050, but even on the low preset at 1080p, this card fails to do that. While it still beats the GTX 1650, averaging 46 FPS, that's only a 21% increase in performance, practically matching the 1650 if they were released at the same time for their same prices. That being said, I'm still disappointed it can't reach 60 FPS, even running the low settings I have it set to. It's pretty clear, at least in this title, to reach a decent graphical fidelity and frame rates, you'll have to use DLSS. Counter-Strike 2 shows similar promise in the numbers again, reaching 145 FPS average at 1080p recommended, but that's still only a 20% increase in performance. I'm really starting to wonder what was in the mind of Nvidia when they decided to raise the price with such a minimal improvement after such a long time. Finally, we reached a game with enough of a performance bump to somewhat justify the price with F124, hitting 120 FPS with our wet benchmark. It only took until the last game of my lineup to see a performance improvement that really increased the value of this card, but only one modern title in the lineup seeing a true improvement isn't a good sign. Time Spy gave us a good showing as well, hitting a graphic score of 2208, or 26% better than the 1650. That's a pretty big performance bump over a previous entry level budget champion, but this still doesn't feel right. Time Spy is nearing a decade old and it's showing the budget sector is still lagging behind. I'm not saying we need an RTX 3050 that follows the exact same increases in specs as we saw in 2014, although it would be pretty cool to have an entry level card with 22GB of video memory for under $200, but the GPU market today is starting a descent into cards being too expensive for their lack of performance improvements. We're at a point where prices are going up at higher rates than performances, while the previous generations of cards didn't face this issues, or at least not to the same degree. This isn't something the CPU market deals with. Just look at the last 7 or so generations of AMD processors. All of them have managed to keep prices stable or even significantly lower at the higher end, despite massive performance increases over the last decade. And while it's not totally the fault of GPU manufacturers that games have issues running especially on entry level cards, as game optimization is a topic for a whole other video, 
companies like Nvidia aren't making it any better by leaning on technologies like DLSS and frame generation to excuse not giving gamers the performance they pay for while massively raising prices on every level. The GPU market is in a bad spot, and I blame Nvidia for setting a standard that you can charge more while providing less. And if something isn't done about it and prices keep skyrocketing while performance stagnates, we'll reach a point of critical mass. I really hope the next generation of graphics cards has Nvidia come back to reality, but until then, my server PC that I've been benchmarking all of these cards in will be proudly featuring my EVGA GTX 1650, I'll find another system for the 8800 GTS 512, and someday I'll find a project for my GTX 970. But if there's one thing I've really learned today, it's that the NVIDIA GeForce 8800 GTS 512 is the greatest graphics card of all time and nobody can tell me otherwise.